online giving is a safe, convenient way to donate in support of the mission of Hillsboro MB. Enter the amount you would like to donate in the appropriate fields. The ACH offset fee is a voluntary addition you can make to your donation to offset the 2% credit card processing fee. The church is not charged a processing fee if you choose to donate directly from your checking account. Choose the frequency and date of your donation. You have the option of donating by credit card or through your bank checking account. Welcome, we're glad to have you for another HMBC at home and glad you joined us today. Got a great service. Uh, also, I wanted to just do one quick announcement, which is uh, one of our families in our church, the Mosses, just had a baby on Wednesday. So we want to welcome Brooks, Elias, Alan, Moss, to this world and I congratulate the Moss family and the Barkmans who are the grandparents. Um, normally we have a little uh, rose, I think, a carnation for, you know, for that, but I, we don't have everybody on staff right now. Uh, and so I had to do my own, I just found this potted plant. So there, that's, that's in honor of Brooks. Welcome. And uh, let's go ahead and we're gonna go into our, our service and with some worship. But let's pray first. Lord God, we thank you for this time to join together, um, even across the internet and in various homes. Uh, but we are one church, and we look forward to the time where we can gather again. We pray that you would um, have your hand on, on our community and protect us uh, from the, the virus. And end this soon so that we can get back together. Uh, but Lord, use this time. We ask that even while we're away, while we're having to, 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 to lock down or be home, teach us through this time, Lord. What, what, what do you have to say to us? What do you want us to strip down and learn uh, about ourselves and what we need to maybe give up and what we need to put in? We pray now, Lord, um, as we go through the service and worship you through, through music and through the word that you speak into our hearts. We give you this time. We dedicate it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul.
my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise so amazing, love so amazing, yeah, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed
Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hello there. Hey, come on in. Yeah, come inside. Oh, can't, can't get in? Is the, the door too narrow? Well, I guess you're just out of luck. Is that kind of what it feels like when we read this passage? Maybe for the first time, or maybe even multiple times? Like, what is Jesus saying with this door being narrow? Kind of feels like I'm this big person like Alice in Wonderland with a small door, and I need to drink some bottles so that I can shrink down and get through the door. Like, that, that salvation is difficult. Or that God might have even made salvation difficult. Uh, or that there's some kind of works. Jesus says, strive to get in, into that narrow door. Not everybody's going to do it. Is he making it difficult for us? Uh, is there something we have to do? Is there some secret uh, or some works that we have to perform? It's not what he's saying. Let's find out what he's saying. So when we find a difficult text of Scripture that seems unclear, or, or maybe is unclear, what we want to do is use clear scripture to help us understand the unclear. So I want to look at a few verses on salvation to just dispel any possibilities uh, of salvation being by works. And some of the maybe misconceptions that we might get just on first glance at what Jesus is saying here. So Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, classic, right? For uh, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. So, you know, we see in this passage, it's, salvation is not by works, it's clearly, it's a gift, you can't work for a gift, it's by grace, which is um, the power of God, it's His power that saves us, not anything that we can do on ourselves we get that through faith, 
And uh, salvation comes by faith, by believing and putting our trust in Jesus. So it's not by works, it's by faith uh, through grace. Uh, and so uh, Matthew 18, 14, another one, uh, Jesus says, is not the will of your Father in heaven that any one of these little ones perish. So we know that God is not out there trying to make salvation tricky. So this narrow door concept cannot mean that God is trying to make it difficult to be saved, like as if he's stingy about who he lets in and who he doesn't. He wants everyone to be saved. It is his will that none perish. Not one gets lost. And then John 1, 10 through 12 says that Jesus, he was in this world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And this, this passage has a lot. It's John's kind of summary of what was going on in Jesus' ministry. He came to his own. He came to the Jews, the people that he'd created, and they rejected him. And that's what we're seeing in this passage is he's talking to the Jewish people, and the Jewish people, his own, are rejecting him. Um, and, but it says is in, those who didn't, and not all of them did reject him, uh, there were many that did receive him. And those who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. And so salvation is not this works, it's receiving Jesus. So what does Jesus mean when he talks about this door being narrow? Let's go ahead and read this passage again. So then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. So he's on, to re refresh our memories, he's, he's on the way to Jerusalem. And it takes several chapters and a lot of teaching uh, along the way to get to Jerusalem. But he's going to Jerusalem to die. Um, he set his face towards Jerusalem. Then on the way there, someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? We don't know what the motivation for this question was. It might follow from uh, the context of the, the yeast and that starting out small uh, in the flour that we did a couple weeks ago, talked about. Uh, and so they're getting this idea that, okay, the kingdom's starting small, so maybe only a few people are getting saved. And so they asked this question, are only a few people going to be saved? And Jesus' answer is, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. And then you'll say, we ate and drank with you and we, you, you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. And there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. So this, this concept of the narrow door um, is that uh, just because you're a Jew doesn't mean you're in the kingdom. That's, he's speaking in particularly to the Jews here. Now, there will be application for us, we'll get to, but uh, we want to first look at what did the, what's the original context, what did it mean to the people that he was talking to uh, originally. And then we want to look at, well, what does that mean for me? And so, what did it mean to them? He's saying, look, at, you guys are all counting on salvation because you're Jews, but don't. Or you're counting on salvation because you're rich or you're a religious leader. Don't. These things don't save you. The only thing that's going to save you is by knowing me. So strive to put off uh, what um, is going on around you, what the, these religious leaders are saying, or you're counting on your riches, get rid of those kind of, that kind of thinking and just follow me. Deny yourself and, and follow me was his call. 
And, and, and we see this in the response. He, he goes into this, the, the day that the door is closed and there's judgment. It's the day of judgment, which will come. And those people are going to say, you know, I, didn't, we, didn't we know you? Didn't we hang out? We, we spent time together with you, right? So aren't, aren't we supposed to be in that door? And uh, Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. Get away from me. Uh, and uh, there is the reality of hell. hell. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth where those will go. So they, the door is narrow. The time for salvation is when Jesus is present with you. What are you going to do, he's saying, with me? He's been saying this all along. Repent. Repent. Now's the time to repent. Uh, but they're, they're not. So, what is this striving? Striving, you know, to, to be saved requires no work, but it doesn't require nothing on our part. We can't work for our salvation, but there is something to do. If we look at some passages, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27 says, Do you not know, Paul writes, that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. So we've got to run. And we've got to run in a certain way. He says everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I, I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So the idea of, uh, of what we have to do in order to, to claim the prize, to have salvation, is we need to beat our body into submission. We basically have to deny ourselves. We've got to stop living for ourselves and keep telling ourselves, no, I'm not the king of my life. I'm not the Lord. Jesus is Lord. He who confesses with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in his heart that he rose from the dead will be saved. And so we need to make him our, the forgiver of our lives, but also the Lord of our lives. And we oftentimes forget that in this day and age. Uh, people don't want to talk about lordship salvation, that, that, that salvation comes by placing Jesus as your Lord, taking yourself off the throne. That used to be common. And today... We, we go for easy salvation, emotional salvation. And your life's going to be so much easier and better uh, with Jesus. But that doesn't save you. What saves you is making Jesus the Lord of your life. Philippians 2, 12-13, Paul writes, says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. Look, he said, whoa, whoa, that right there, Paul is saying, we've got to work out our salvation. It's works. But listen, he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So working out your salvation is humbling yourself, fear and trembling. It's putting God in control. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So, um, that working out our salvation is not actually doing works, it's allowing God to work within us. Um, I uh, just, you know, for the last year or two, I guess two years, my barbecue has not been working the, the right, the ignition stopped working, and I pushed the igniter and, and nothing happened. So for a long time, I was trying to think, oh, it's just something's not working there. And so I, I would rub it certain ways, trying to get it to, to, to do something, and it wouldn't do anything. So then I'm like, I guess this is broken. So I got a, a, just a lighter, and I w I've been lighting it by hand, move off the grill uh, plates, and then stick it down in there, light it manually. And I've been doing that for a couple of years until I just realized there's a battery in the igniter. <laughs> I had no idea that igniters had a battery in them, but a simple little double A battery. And so I'm like, oh, there's a battery. And so I replaced the battery today and it works. 
so, so easy. But I've been working so hard trying, you know, trying to get that thing started on my own when it was just let the battery do the work. And in our lives, in regards to salvation, it's not about us doing the work, it's about letting God do the work, letting Him be the battery of life, letting Him be inside of us uh, working out our salvation. Luke 9, 23 to 24 says, Then He said to them all, If anyone would come after Me, he must deny himself, Jesus said, and take up his cross and follow Me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, uh, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. So if you want salvation, you've got to lose your life. You've got to deny yourself. So works is all about just letting go and letting God be in control of our lives. It's obviously, it's, it's putting our faith in the fact that Jesus died for our sins, that I can't save myself, and so he's my, the, my forgiver, and I'm going to put my trust in him, that he took my, my sins upon himself and paid the price for those. And then he arose again so that he can give me life. Um, and he's conquered death. And so I have life in him. And it's believing in that, trusting in that, and then saying, I'm no longer going to live for myself. I'm, I died with you on that cross so that now I can be resurrected in your resurrection life and live for you, not for myself. So you've got these people then in the story that are on the outside. They were in the midst of Jesus. They were around Him, but they were missing out on knowing Him. Salvation comes through the means of Jesus uh, or not at all. We, we learn here too. Uh, when, by the, this is a narrow door. And so his point is, that there's lots of avenues that people will take for salvation. For the Jews, it was, I'm a Jew, so I'm just naturally saved. But it could be, I'm a good person, uh, or I go to church. Uh, I, I have a Christian family, Christian upbringing, and we can be trying to enter or we think, well, as long as I'm religious, it doesn't even matter what religion, as long as I'm devoted to something spiritual, something other. A lot of people believe that. And Jesus is saying, no, it's, it's by me and me alone. There is no other way of salvation. The door is narrow. So find your way to me. Put your trust in me. So the, the point... There were, you know, some points that we get from this is proximity to Jesus is not enough. Just being around him is not enough. Responding to his lordship is necessary. Two, that there are many ways to heaven. That there are not many ways to heaven. Jesus is the only way. And three, Jesus isn't being exclusive. He's not trying to uh, not trying to kick people out or not let people in. Jesus is not being exclusive. He wants everyone to be saved. In John 3, 14 to 17, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, that was you know, during the Exodus time, uh, the Israelites rebelled against God and he was punishing them and they were, they were uh, dying by snake bites. He sent snakes through there and they were all uh, dying. And so... God told Moses to, to make a bronze snake and put it up on a staff. And everybody, if they looked to that bronze serpent, they would be saved. They'd be healed. And Jesus takes this as a metaphor um, for himself. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so if you look to the snake, you'll be saved, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. I'm talking about on the cross. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only, uh, one and only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. God does not want people to perish. That's why He gave His one and only Son. 
That's why He died on the cross for us. So God is not exclusive, as some think exclusive. But not everybody is included because Jesus is the only way. So what, what stops us from striving to enter through the narrow door? You know, indifference. I think some people just don't care. A lot of people uh, in this generation just don't care. They don't give much thought to the end of life, to there's going to be a judgment, what happens after death. Just live for the day. And so that would stop from striving to enter through the narrow door. Stop trying to find the truth. People aren't pursuing truth very much anymore. They just don't care. And maybe that's you. Just going about your life and not really thinking about the eternity. Uh, or we're living for this world. And usually that happens as a result of this. But there could be other reasons we do this. But we live for this world and our focus is on this world and making our life the best it can be now. And this life is not what God has designed uh, to, to be our best life, to be the end. This life is the, sort of the testing ground. It's the, t- it's the time for us to find Him so that we can spend eternity with Him and have our best life then. Uh, maybe we don't want to change, and so that stops us from striving. We don't want to have to give up anything or sacrifice anything. I just want to live how I want to live. Uh, or we don't think it's fair that some people, it's like, ah, if, if Christianity is the only way, if Jesus is the only way, that's not fair. If, if there's not a good answer for all the rest of the people uh, out in the world to come to salvation, then that doesn't seem fair, and so they reject it. But the question is then, who is your authority? Is it you or is it God's word? Is God the authority or are you the authority? All this stuff stems from pride, that we're, our eyes are on ourselves, we're living for ourselves, or we think that we're better than God. The same sin that Adam and Eve had of elevating themselves above God. Uh, we might assume that God has let all decent people in. Or we, we put our confidence in being religious. And so that stops us from striving to enter that narrow door. Let's uh, continue on, just touch on a little bit on this, this last part of the text. After Jesus talked about this narrow door and the judgment, then In verse 31, it says, At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus, and they said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. We don't know if they were trying to actually really wanting to warn Jesus, or they're just trying to get rid of Jesus. We don't know what their motivation was, if these were good Pharisees, because some Pharisees did follow Jesus. Maybe these were good ones. Uh, And they were really sincerely looking out for Jesus. Um, Or maybe they had some ulterior motive. And then it says, he replied to them, you go tell that fox, uh, which was a, a put down that, you know, I don't really care much about Herod. He's not really in control. God is. So he replied, go, you go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. Now, that doesn't mean that in three days, Jesus will be in Jerusalem. That three day concept is, a, is an idiom in Judaism, three days, just means a short period of time. It says, In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. So I'm going to continue doing my messianic thing of blessing people, healing people, and as I'm on my way to Jerusalem, to die. Because that's where I'm going to die. That's the plan. And then, then he says, and this is so great to see Jesus' heart. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Basically, you're not going to see me until the second coming, until I come down and um, at, at the end of the judgment. But this, this image of the hen, ah, Jesus is saying, I wanted to come here to my people 
and gather you under my wings and give you salvation and protect you, love you, and, uh, and just have that kind of an intimate relationship with you, and you, you rejected it. You rejected me. So the question for us you know, today is, have we surrendered to him? Have you surrendered to him? Where are you at? Are you putting your trust in church? Are you putting your trust in this world, in your goodness? Are you not even caring about salvation or worried about that? We need to stop and consider, have I really given my life to Jesus? Have I taken myself off of the throne of my life and put God on the throne of my life? 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Chronicles 16.9 close with this idea. You know, just kind of wraps up the idea of this, of this narrow door and, 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 and God not being uh, stingy about who comes in. It says, um, you know, because uh, you know, it could sound like the God is hiding from us and we got to like really try and find him, but it's actually the reverse God's not hiding from us. We're hiding from Him. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of God move to and fro throughout the earth, that He may strongly support those whose heart is completely His. God's looking for you. He's seeking you. But are you willing to give your heart completely to Him? Saying, yeah, I'm not living for myself. I'm going to deny myself, deny myself, I'm going to live for you. God is a good God, a loving God. He's a mother hen. And he wants to put you under his wings. Will you, unlike Jerusalem, will you allow him to shelter you under his wings? Let's pray. Lord God, uh, it breaks my heart to know that there's so many people out there living their lives without any regard to you. We're just living for ourselves. I pray, Father, that you draw those people to you. And, and, and in our church, Lord, if the statistics are true, there is a lot of people in our church that are just going to church and doing the motions but don't have a relationship with you. Because that's what's true about the churches in America. A lot of church goers, but not a lot of saved people. So I pray that today would be the day of salvation for some of the people in our church who've been going through the motions, have been casual Christians, but never really given themselves to you. Help us, Lord. We can't do it on our own. It's, it's, to stop living for ourselves is difficult and to start living for you. But, but all we got to do is just surrender and trust you and allow you to lead. We thank you that you died on the cross for us, that you paid the price, that we can follow you, that we can have a relationship with the creator of the universe. We pray that, and we pray for, uh, for our nation, for the world, for our community. Um, may your kingdom come, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close, uh, as we often do, with the doxology, uh, because we want to praise God and give Him the glory, because it's all about Him, it's not about us.